Yeah. So today I'm going to be talking mainly about audio buffers and things that you can do with them and how to, how to create your own if you have a need for that or if you want to do that. Um, just a, a little bit about me. So I am an audio developer in Seattle. Uh, previously, I was working at Tesla and before that I was studying at Karma. Um, and nowadays I mostly make plugins. I use Juice and various other uh, tools. Um, so kind of what I'm going to talk through today is first just talking about uh, containers in C++ and kind of the different things that they do and the different features that they have. Um, I'll talk about building up your own audio buffer from essentially from scratch, but really starting from the C++ standard library. Uh, and then I'll talk about a few other sort of auxiliary things like buffer views, uh, buffer math operations, and then buffer iterators. Uh, and yeah, hopefully it'll be fun and we'll, we'll learn some things along the way. So starting off just with C++ containers, um, I'm going to define a container as just something that gives you access to multiple other things. Uh, usually they're all the same type, but I guess maybe they don't have to be. And if you're talking to C++ people about containers, they'll usually separate them between contiguous containers and associative containers. And the idea is that a contiguous container uh, stores all of the items that your container holds in a contiguous block of memory. So your first item uh, is living in some memory and then the next item is right next to it and so on throughout the, the length of your container. Uh, with an associative container, that might be something like a set or a map where things kind of live all around memory, but then they're able to point to each other or access each other uh, through various means. Um, for today's purposes, we don't really care much about associative containers, but uh, I think it's good to mention them just to know that they're there. Um, for today's purposes, I think it's more useful to split uh, our discussion between owning containers and non-owning containers. Um, this is kind of my own definition. I think there's other definitions as well that talk about the same idea. Um, but the idea with an owning container is that the container manages its own memory. So uh, if the memory is allocated on the heap, then when the container goes out of scope, it will free that memory. Uh, or if the memory is allocated on the stack, then that memory will be invalidated when the container goes out of scope. Um, typically, if you need to pass an owning container to a function, you're going to pass it by reference because most of the time these containers can be expensive to copy. And when you make a copy, the copy is going to refer to some different memory than the original. So if the idea is that, oh, I'll pass my container into this function, and then the function will modify the stuff inside the container, that doesn't really work if your copy refers to a totally different chunk of memory. So some examples of this, uh, I'm sure everyone's used them, are standard array, standard string, and standard vector. Um, the, these are all kind of your classic owning containers. With non-owning containers, these are usually things that you'll see labeled as a span or a view in kind of the way they're named. Um, and the idea with a non-owning container is that the memory for that container is managed somewhere else. Um, and I'll, I'll give an example of this in a second, but it's, it's useful to know that if you're using a non-owning container, you're responsible for making sure that the lifetime of the container doesn't go past the lifetime of the underlying memory. Um, with a non-owning container, they're usually very cheap to copy. So people usually pass them by value. And when you make a copy, it still refers to the same data. <coughs> and again, I'll give an example of this in a second here. Uh, so some classic examples of non-owning containers are string view, which uh, was added to C++ in C++ 17, uh, standard span in C++ 20, and then MD span, which uh, will be coming in C++ 23, or maybe you already have it if you're uh, kind of on the cutting edge of C++ compilers. So this is kind of your most basic implementation that you could have for a standard span. Um, I'm sure the real implementations in Clang and MSVC are probably uh, a good bit more involved, but the basic idea is that you have some pointer to your data and then some 
integer like value to keep track of the size. Um, you could also do it as like a begin and end pointer or something like that. Um, but it's kind of the same idea. You just need to know where does my block of data start and end. And uh, as you can see, this is a, a very uh, a very small class. It has a very small memory footprint. You could copy it. You could pass it around to different functions, and and uh, it will be cheap to do so. Um, so a, a little example of using a span. So in this case, we have a function, and the idea is that we want to take some span of integers and we want to add one to all of them. So what we could do is we could have, for example, a vector, uh, and we can pass the vector to the function, which will implicitly convert it to a span, and it will do the operation and, and modify the data in the vector. We could also explicitly construct a span and pass that to the function, and that works fine as well. Um, but then what we need to be careful about is that if we, for example, here we could free all the memory in the vector. Uh, now, if we try to do something with the span that we had created, then we're going to get a bad memory access uh, because the memory that the data view expects to be there is no longer there. Um, so that's something to watch out for when you're working with non-owning containers. Uh, I want to give another example just to show how like constness works with, uh, with non-owning containers. So here we have a function that's going to take two spans of integers, add them together, and put the results in some other span. Um, and so here, uh, again, since the spans are being passed around by value, what we need to do is make sure that the uh, the constness of the container applies to the type in the container, not necessarily to the container itself. So if we were to make this a const span of ints, that wouldn't really mean anything because we're making copies of these spans when we pass them into the function. So being const or not doesn't really matter so much. Uh, really what we care about is that the data inside the span is constant. And so that's how we, we make it clear to the compiler that that's what we want to do. And then in this case, we're going to use arrays just to show that arrays can also be implicitly converted into spans. Um, so that's kind of how you would use a non-owning container in more, gen more general C++ code. Um, and again, just some, some guidelines. If you're the user, you're responsible for managing the lifetime of the container relative to the memory that it's referring to. Um, in most cases, there will be an implicit conversion to go from some owning container to a non-owning container. Um, and then if you want something to be const, make sure you're applying that constness to the type and not to the container itself. Um, being that we're doing audio programming, we also want to know about memory allocation and, and where that fits in. So uh, if you're just kind of going through your C++ containers and you want to think about when it will or won't allocate memory, if you're using a standard array, that will never allocate or deallocate memory on the heap. Uh, if you're using vector, it's very specific in the C++ specification when vector will or won't allocate memory. So here's kind of a, a simplified version of the rules for when vector will allocate memory. Um, there's a lot more nuances to this, but you know, if you care about that, uh, you should go read the, the spec for it. Uh, on the other hand, something like standard string is a lot less specific about when it will allocate or not allocate memory. And this is, at least to my understanding, mostly because of the small string optimization, which could be more implementation defined rather than specified by the C++ standard itself. Um, and then the non-owning containers in the C++ standard library will never allocate or deallocate memory. So that's always a, a good thing to know as well. So yeah, that's just kind of a brief overview of uh, some containers in C++ and how they're put together and how they can be used. Um, and so now we can talk about creating an audio buffer. And so uh, this is something that I started doing about a year and a half ago when I was working on a project that... Uh, I kind of needed an audio buffer for. And uh, so I started thinking, okay, well, what, what do I need my audio buffer to be able to do? Uh, and so for now, I want to make an owning container uh, to be my audio buffer. Later, we'll talk about a non-owning kind of version of this container as well. And so kind of to start, I was thinking, well, okay, I want 
sort of a two-dimensional data structure uh, that holds a bunch of samples. So usually these will be floats or doubles, but maybe it could be other things too. Um, I want it to be dynamically allocated and resizable. So basically, I don't want to have to know the size of the buffer at compile time. I want to be able to have it be determined at runtime. And then I want to be able to shrink the buffer without reallocating memory. So something that uh, happens a lot in my code is like, okay, I know that the maximum block size for whatever audio process I'm going to do is like 256, but it could be used with a smaller block size, like 128 or something. So I want to be able to shrink the buffer from 256 to 128 without reallocating memory and then grow it back to 256 still without reallocating memory. Um, I guess if I wanted to go past 256 and that would require reallocating memory, but that's something that I have to pay attention to as the user. Um, and so my first thought was, well, I could just use like a type def so I could have my buffer class just be a vector of vectors. And the reason why I didn't do this is first of all, um, with an audio buffer, we usually want all of the, like we would want all of the vectors, uh, all of the inner vectors to have the same size. Um, Cause typically you have some number of samples, some number of channels, and depending on which way you store it, whichever one is the inner size, we want to be the same all the way through the, the buffer. And you can't really have a hard guarantee on that um, if, you're, if you're doing a vector of vectors like this. And so that kind of made me a little bit wary about doing it this way. And then I also wanted to uh, have a little more control over the memory layout, which I'll talk about in a second here. Uh, if you're right on top of like the, the latest in the C++ standard library, you might say, well, why not use uh, standard MD span or MD array? And at the time those didn't really exist yet, or at least I wasn't aware of them. Um, it seems like those would be really good candidates for doing this kind of stuff now. And if, if folks are using uh, MD span or MD array for audio buffers, I, I'd be really curious to hear your experience and to see uh, how, how those are working for you. Um, but yeah, MD span is in C23 and MD array, I think is gonna be in C26. And uh, yeah, I wanna make sure that whatever buffer type I'm using is probably at least compatible with C14 or C11, um, certainly C17. So yeah, I wasn't quite ready to go for uh, the, the latest of the latest C++ stuff yet. Um, but again, if, if you're doing that, I'm curious to hear your experience. Um, so next I wanted to talk a little bit about memory layout. So uh, if you're familiar with matrix math and, and libraries like Eigen and things like that, uh, you might've heard of this thing uh, where the matrix can be stored in row major order or column major order. Uh, and so the example here, we have a matrix that has nine values in it. And the way that a library like Eigen would store those nine values is it would create uh, an array or a vector that is nine numbers long, and then it would store them in chunks of three. So uh, if you wanna do a row major matrix, then you would do uh, your first three numbers in the array would be A1, A11, A12, and A13. So you would go across the first row, then you would go to the next row and do those three, the next row and do those three. On the other hand, if you wanna do column major ordering, the first three numbers would be going down the first column and then going down the second column and so on. And so if you're thinking about an audio buffer, you've kind of got the same dilemma, which is, <laughs> do you want your buffer to be channel major or sample major in terms of how the, the data is stored? Um, in other words, do you want all of the samples in one channel to be next to each other in memory? And then the next, the samples in the next channel and so on? Uh, or do you want it to be all of the samples at this time step and then all of the samples at the next time step across your channels as, as you go down? Um, for myself, I prefer channel major ordering. So basically you have all of the samples in one channel and then all of the samples in the next channel and so on. Uh, and the reason for this is that most of the time your buffers are gonna have more samples than they're gonna have channels. And if you wanna do kind of longer vectorized operations, it's usually better to do those along the longer axis uh, of whatever you know your data, depending on how your data is stored. Um, 
I'm sure for some use cases, sample major ordering is better. Uh, my guess would be if you have a lot of channels and really small buffer sizes, so maybe you would have more channels than samples in your buffer. Maybe this is true for some like spatial audio applications. Um, or maybe if you're doing like a polyphonic synthesizer and you want to vectorize across your channels instead of across your samples, then maybe uh, that ordering would be better. Uh, I'm just throwing out some hypotheticals. I, I don't think I've seen a scenario in my own work where I think sample major would really be better. <coughs> So with that, we can actually start creating our buffer. And so this is like my most basic audio buffer uh, <laughs> class. So here we have a vector and that's gonna have all of our raw data in it. And then we're gonna store the data in that vector. And the amount of data we're gonna need is the number of channels times the number of samples. And so that should leave enough room for all of our data. But then I was thinking about it and I was like, well, that's great, but what about alignment? And so uh, the idea with data alignment is that sometimes for, uh, for vectorization, we want to have your data aligned to some SIMD byte boundary or something like that. Um, and I guess this will depend on like the hardware you're running on and what kind of SIMD instructions you have access to and whatnot. Um, but in this case, uh, <coughs> The way that I ended up doing it was taking a aligned allocator implementation. Uh, I used the one from the XMD library, but there's, there's plenty of good ones out there. Um, and then after you align your, your, the start of your vector to whatever byte boundary you want, then you should also pad the number of samples so that each channel starts on the same byte boundary and with the same alignment. Um, so that, that's what I'm doing here with this num samples padded uh, business. So then you can think, okay, well, what if I want a, a pointer to the individual channels? So if you're using juice buffers, this would be like the get right pointer function. Um, the way that I've chosen to do that for now is to have this array of pointers with, that I call channel pointers. And then I have some maximum number of channels that I'm allowed to have in my buffer and that's determined at compile time. Um, and, and I'll come back to that in a minute, but basically, the idea is that when I set the maximum size of my buffer, I set all of the channel pointers to the right offset in the, uh, in the raw data. And then I can return the channel pointer that I want at any time. And then finally, I wanna be able to resize my buffer. So when I set the maximum size and I allocate the data and all that, I just start by setting my member variables for the number of channels and the number of samples to the maximum size channels and samples. But then if I want to resize uh, the buffer at any time, I can just give it a new number of channels, a number of samples and set those values. And then this is just slide code, but in my real code, I have some assertions to make sure that uh, I'm not going past the maximum uh, allocated size when I resize it like this. Um, yeah, and then the last thing I might want to do is clear the buffer. And so to do that, I can just fill the vector with zeros or whatever. Uh, if, if I'm using a SIMD type, it'll just be, you know, a zeroed SIMD type. Um, and that's it. So <laughs> that might seem very small, and I, I promise we'll, we'll get to more of the, the fancy stuff in a second. But just to recap what we've got so far, so we have a dynamically allocated buffer. We can shrink the buffer without reallocating it. We have all of the data in our buffer laid out in one flat block of memory. We have channels that are aligned to some byte boundary that, that you can choose. Uh, we have accessors for the buffer size information and for the individual channel pointers. And we have a function that lets us clear the buffer. And the great thing about setting it up like this is that you can create a buffer with pretty much any data type, so long as that data type is default constructible and can either be copied or moved. So uh, for the most part, you're gonna wanna do this with a float or a double or something like that. But if you have some cool SIMD type that you wanna use instead, again, as long as it's default constructible and can be copied or moved, that should work as well. Um, I tried making a buffer of standard strings, that works. I don't know why you'd want to, but you could if you want. 
Um, so things that we don't have in this class are any buffer math operations. So like if you want to apply some gain to your buffer or something like that, we don't currently have that. And we don't really have operations for interacting with other buffers. Like if I want to make a copy of some other buffer and have that be this buffer, we don't have a way to do that. And I'll come back to that in a minute um, and, and go into more detail about why it's set up that way. So next I wanted to talk about the, the non-owning version of my buffer, which is the buffer view. So, uh, this code looks a little bit ugly, but it's very similar to the standard span uh, implementation that I, I, or the example standard span implementation that I talked about earlier. So the idea here is that we have a number of channels, a number of samples, and then an array of channel pointers. And so when we want to create a buffer view from a buffer, uh, we have all these extra arguments, which we can ignore for now, but basically, we set the number of channels to whatever it needs to be. We set the number of samples to whatever it needs to be. And then we fill our channel pointers accordingly. Um, if you want to have a buffer view of a const type, uh, you can do that starting from a const buffer of that type. Uh, you have to do some funky template stuff, which uh, I don't know that I can explain, even if I wanted to explain it. Uh, <laughs> you'll have to go to Stack Overflow for, for some of that stuff. Um, but other than that, it works out about the same. Um, you, you're basically doing all the same stuff from there. And so uh, I set up a bunch of constructors that kind of allow for the same sorts of implicit conversion as you could do with standard span, for example. Um, so if you have a buffer, you can create a buffer view. If you have a buffer view, you can create another buffer view. So that can be like if you need to resize your buffer view, uh, you don't really need a, a resize option. Oh, my internet browser is uh, freaking out on me here. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so you never really need to resize a buffer view. You just create a new buffer view from your old one with different dimensions. Um, I use juice a bunch, so I have conversions going from juice audio buffer or juice audio block into a buffer view. Uh, you can also go from some raw data to a buffer view. And then if you have some non-const data structure, you can make a const buffer view from that structure for any of these above uh, types. Um, so, so that's kind of all of the implicit conversions that I want to be able to do. Uh, but I guess if I needed more, I could probably implement more pretty easily. Um, and the idea, like with standard span, is that it should be really cheap to copy a buffer view. Um, and so what I've been doing with this like max number of channels uh, compile time definition is I start with that at like 32 or something pretty big. So uh, if I do need like, you know, some large buffers for like spatial audio or maybe like a reverb or something like that, I can do it. Uh, but then usually when I'm close to releasing some software, I'll go through and see like what's the largest buffer that I'm using. And then I'll set it to something smaller. Usually it can do two or four or something like that. And that just makes everything a tiny bit faster. So that's kind of nice. Um, and so I wanted to give a little example of kind of using buffer and buffer view in tandem. So the idea here is I have some processor that has its own buffer. Uh, when I prepare that processor, I can set the maximum size for it. Uh, and then when I want to run some process, I can call processor one's process function with my buffer. So this is the owning buffer. And when I write processor one, I can just write that as taking a buffer view and do whatever I wanna do to the buffer. And that will apply to stuff in this buffer here. So again, it's kind of like the examples I was showing at the beginning uh, using standard vector and going to standard span from there. So now we can talk about some buffer math. So if you look at a lot of uh, audio buffer implementations in Juice or various other libraries, you'll see math operations implemented as member functions within the buffer. And I chose not to do that. And the reason why is that first of all, I've seen that it tends to lead to a lot of duplicate implementations. So for example, in my case, I would have to do one implementation for buffer class and another implementation for the buffer view class. Um, 
I found that it also makes it very difficult to use those containers with any data type. So float and double usually work fine, but once you get past that, uh, things tend to become more difficult. And again, I'll, I'll give an example of this in a second. Um, the one exception to this is the clear function. So uh, right now I have clear, I have clear implemented as a member function. And the reason for that is that I can kind of keep track of uh, the buffer state as far as whether or not it's clear. And that could allow me to do some optimizations elsewhere. I'm not doing that at the moment in my own code, but that's something I'm hoping to do in the future. And so having clear as a member function uh, is, is pretty helpful for, for making that happen. So if I were to try doing a buffer with these math functions as member functions, it might look something like this. So uh, I would have some apply gain function where I have some number t, and I want to multiply all of the numbers in my buffer by this number t. So uh, if t is a floating point type, then maybe I could just do some vectorized multiply and multiply all of the numbers by the gain. Um, but if t is not a floating point type, then maybe I need to do some kind of uh, other operation. And so this is something that might work for, for a lot of types. Uh, we just do a standard transform. Uh, but the problem is that this expects that the multiply operator will be valid between whatever type X is and uh, the type T that your gain is. And, you know, for most math types, that will be true, but maybe you have some SIMD type where that's not true uh, and you need some other, you, you need to call some other function to get your multiply to work. Um, I, I don't want that to prohibit you from using that type for a buffer, uh, a buffer class. Um, so that's why these functions are not member functions. Um, and so instead, I have this buffer math namespace, and I have a ton of functions in here for copying and uh, applying gain and doing various things. And so just as an example, the same apply gain function, we have some buffer type, which is a template type. And then we have some gain, which is uh, some float type, which hopefully will be uh, the same type as the type in the buffer, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and then there's an implementation of this that does what you would expect to do for, for most, you know, math-like math types. Um, and so the idea here is kind of twofold. So one, um, this should work for any buffer type, as long as it has kind of a uniform-ish interface. Um, so it should work for a buffer, a buffer view, a juice audio buffer, so on. Um, but the other nice thing about this is that the buffer type itself doesn't actually need to be defined yet when this function is defined. Um, so I can kind of decouple those two bits of code. Um, so the idea, again, is just to try to make these buffer classes very easily extensible. So um, you can make a buffer or a buffer view with your own data types if you want. Um, hopefully the buffer math implementations will work for those data types. Um, but if you need to do some specific math operations, either because, you know, for example, the multiplication operator is not supported by your data type, or uh, there's some optimization that you can do if you do something your own way, um, you can kind of implement those as you go. So you don't need to implement everything as soon as you try to use that class like you would with uh, a member function uh, or a buffer that had math member functions. Um, instead, you can just wait until you actually need that function and then implement it. And it's really non-intrusive. So you never need to like fork or copy paste stuff except as maybe like a, a, a base for the function that you want to implement for yourself. So for example, uh, <laughs> again, kind of the stupid example of making a buffer of strings if you wanted to do that and have the supply gain function still work, uh, you could just do it like this, where you basically create your template class for that, that buffer type. And then you can implement your own buffer math namespace and implement your own apply gain function. Whatever that means for your use case, I, I really don't know. Um, but yeah, so really the, the idea here is that this would be useful for working with different types of SIMD uh, SIMD wrappers and things like that. Um, so hopefully that's, that's useful for folks. Um, yeah, so finally, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about iterators. So 
if you've worked with audio buffers before, I'm sure you've written some code that looks something like this, where you want to iterate over the channels in your buffer, and then you want to iterate over all the samples in that channel, and you want to do something to each sample. Um, so there's a few problems with this code. I mean, it, it's fine, it works, but it's not great, right? So first of all, it's kind of wordy. You've gone through, what, like five or six lines of code just to express something very simple. Um, but even with all that wordiness, I don't find it very expressive because it, you kind of have to dig through it a little bit to find what you're actually trying to say, which is, oh, I want to apply some function to all of the samples in this buffer. Uh, the second problem is that channel data is a raw pointer. So there's not really anything to stop you from just going past the end of it and, and doing something wrong. Um, and you, know, you can implement some checks for that, but it's a little bit cumbersome to do that everywhere. Um, and then once you go beyond kind of this simple case, things get a lot more complicated. Like if you want to iterate over sub blocks of a buffer or iterate over kind of the samples as the outer loop and the channels as the inner loop. So um, I was kind of thinking about this and then uh, I was thinking about Python. And for folks who are familiar with Python, you probably know about these enumerate and zip iterators um, that, that are pretty standard in Python these days. And uh, these are kind of nice because with enumerate, you can get the index of the thing in your list as, all, as well as the thing itself. Uh, with zip, you can iterate over two lists simultaneously. So yeah, there's kind of some nice ways to do things very neatly and expressively in Python. And so you might think, well, can we do this in C++? And the answer is yes. Uh, it's just more complicated, I guess. Uh, so <laughs> this is something that Bacon Paul showed me from the Surge Synth team. And the original author of this code is this fellow, Nathan Reed. Uh, he has a, a blog post about it, which I, I definitely suggest reading if you're interested in this kind of thing. So this is his implementation of an enumerate iterator in C++. And if we ignore all the, the complicated iterator stuff, this is how you actually use it. Uh, you just do a for loop over your index and your items, and then you can enumerate your vector and get both of those things. Um, so it ends up being pretty neat and pretty similar to what you can do in Python. And so then my next thought was, well, let's do that for audio buffers. So this is a channels iterator uh, for some buffer type. And the idea is that uh, basically as you go through the channels, for each channel, it will return a tuple containing the channel index and a span of the channel data. Um, so I guess this is C++ 20, but you, you can make a C++ 17 version of it pretty easily as well. Um, and so then when you go to use it, you can just say, okay, I want to iterate over the channels of my buffer. That'll give me my channel and a span uh, over the channel data. And then I can enumerate that span and process each sample however I want. Um, there's also a few other iterators that we worked out. So this is a, a samples iterator. So this iterates over the samples as the outer loop. Uh, this is actually something that Rachel Locke from the audio programmer uh, implemented. Uh, so that, that's a nice, uh, a nice way to do things. There's also a sub blocks iterator. So if you want to iterate over like your, your buffer in blocks of 32 samples at a time, you can do that as well. Um, and so the main idea here is just convenience. You can write your code more simply, more expressively, uh, hopefully with fewer errors. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, especially with loop bounds and thinking about where your loops start and end, uh, at least for me, I found it easier to avoid bugs and crashes because of mistakes that I would make there. Um, the downside is that iterators in C++ can be a pain to implement. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're interested in this stuff, definitely give it a try. It can be pretty fun. But if you're not interested in this stuff, then it's probably not worth the effort because it, it is kind of a lot of effort uh, to do this sort of thing. So just to wrap up, uh, at the moment, I have all of this code wrapped up in a juice module, which is uh, under the BSD license. And I have a link there uh, for my repository, which, which has all of that stuff. Um, I've been using this code in various forms and kind of gradually improving it over the last about year and a half now. Um, so hopefully it'll keep getting better. And I'm sure other folks will have ideas for how to improve it as well. So I'm excited to see kind of 
how it continues to evolve. Um, and yeah, just like a few takeaways as far as like uh, lessons maybe that, that you've learned from this talk, hopefully. Uh, so first of all, it's good to understand your containers. It's good to know when something is owning versus non-owning. Uh, it's good to know when your containers might or might not allocate memory. Um, don't be afraid to write your own containers, even if you don't really want to use them. It's just like a learning experience. That's, at least for me, I found it to be really helpful in learning more about C++ and other languages as well. Um, it's good to pay attention to memory layout. I didn't talk about it too much, but this has a pretty big impact on the performance of your software. So uh, again, whether or not you're writing your own containers, pay attention to how the memory is laid out in those containers. And then if you want to have owning and non-owning containers, it's good to have a simple way to convert from the owning version to the non-owning version. Uh, if you're implementing functions for your containers, think carefully about whether you want them to be a member function or a non-member function. Uh, and then, yeah, iterators are great for uh, making things more convenient and more likely to be correct uh, if you can stomach the C++ way of doing them. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, if you want to get in touch, I'm on the audio programmer discord or I'm on uh, email or GitHub pretty, pretty commonly. So yeah, feel free to reach out and, uh, and, and chat and yeah, hopefully I can answer some questions too. Great. Thank you so much, Jason. That was, that was a very awesome presentation as always. Uh, so one of the questions that was earlier on in the presentation was, just defining what real time safe actually means. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about what that means to you when you say real time safe? Sure. Yeah. So um, I feel like kind of the most generic way to uh, say it is like if your code is real time safe, uh, you know how long all of the operations in your code are going to take. Um, and so kind of more specifically, that means there's certain operations that you can't do like a system call or allocating memory or uh, locking, uh, trying to acquire a lock or something like that, because uh, those depend on things that are kind of out of your control and you don't know how long they're going to take. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's some more rigorous definitions out there, but that's kind of the way that I choose to think about it. Yeah. That's, that's always been my understanding as well. Deterministic is always the word that I always hear. Yeah, well, deterministic can be tricky just because like, for example, like if I have a, a, a like a optimizing uh, like equation solver or something like that in my code, like I don't know deterministically how long that's gonna take, but I can kind of put a bound on it. So yeah. Great. Um, not a loon asks, how could other data types other than float or double be useful as a buffer type? Yeah. So, um, recently I was working with something where I needed to use integers just because it was trying to do something, uh, that was emulating like an old, uh, video game console. Uh, and so I needed a buffer of, uh, like 16, uh, eight bit. 8-bit integers or something. It was kind of weird, but that was useful. Um, but probably the most common case for me is SIMD types. So uh, I usually use XSIMD as like my SIMD library of choice. It's not perfect, but it, it, it solves most of my needs. Uh, and so instead of having a buffer of float, I'll have a buffer of like a batch of four floats or something like that. Um, and it ends up working pretty similarly. Uh, kind of going back and forth between the two. Awesome. And uh, Matthew Yi King had a question that wasn't exactly on this topic, but more on the topic of um, machine learning. Um, and he was interested in hearing your thoughts on audio programming with uh, LLMs, Large Language Model Assistance. Have you, uh, do you have any views on that? You know, I haven't, uh, I haven't used them very much, um, or at least I, I haven't really done much as far as like trying to use uh, chat GBT or something to like help my programming. Um, I probably should. People have told me it, it can be very helpful for them. Um, I think kind of mainly what I want is something that's a bit more personalized where like, instead of using something like chat GBT, which is trained on, uh, you know, uh, 
the whole internet's worth of, of code bases and so on. Uh, I think I'd prefer something that's like trained just on like my own code bases or like a few other code bases that I, I feel very confident uh, about how they're, how they're implemented. Um, so yeah, I was, I was fooling around for a little bit with, I think it was called private GPT or something, but I, I couldn't quite get it to work for me. So I, I gave up after a little bit, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to see more of that. And uh, also uh, like, for example, having uh, a version of GPT that's just trained on like the juice documentation or like the eigen documentation or something, I think would be really handy. Um, so yeah, I think for me, the stuff I find interesting is the stuff that's like hyper customized. Uh, <laughs> I'm really excited about that stuff. Yeah, that would be amazing. How about you, Damien? Have you used any LLMs in your coding adventures? Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it kind of helps, you know, for uh, when it gets complicated in C++ for not so much like when you have a lot of templates and those fancy functions like enable F and stuff like that. I never really did the effort of learning all of that. So uh, I'm using so, some AI like in C-Lion to, to get this for me and I think now that I understand it, I could redo it myself. So that's a, also a way of learning it. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Uh, there was a talk a few months ago uh, by Marcus Hobbs who uh, talked a little bit about uh, LLMs and use with Juice and uh, with audio programming. And that was a great talk where he gives uh, some tips on how to maximize your experience with those. And um, so if, you, if you're if you not aware of that, check it out. It's in our archives somewhere. Uh, yeah. And I've had some experience with it as well. Uh, just using it when sometimes when I don't understand a particular piece of code uh, and just, or just trying to get a helping hand on certain things. Uh, it's been helpful, but like they always say, and like Marcus has said in his talk, use it with caution because it's one of those things that you have to, it's important to know what's happening and what's uh, what's going on. It's helped me a lot with CMake actually. It's given me some, oh, some, yeah. CMake, some good CMake help. Uh, so yeah, we all love CMake. Great. I think that's all the questions that we have. I'll give a couple more seconds. Um, just a reminder at the end uh, to thank our sponsors, Focusrite and Sonox, uh, for supporting the audio programmer meetup. Uh, and also, if you'd like to join our audio programmer community, we have discussions like about this and uh, much more. Um, join us on the audioprogrammer.com forward slash community. We also offer development and recruitment services. Uh, those are on the same website, the audioprogrammer.com. So, Jatin, Damien, thank you so much for uh, for your time and taking the time to put these presentations together. The uh, slides for both of these talks are in the video description. Thank you so much for, for hanging out with us. Thanks, yeah, Mike. thanks for having us. Yeah. Cool. Our, uh, as always, our audio programmer meetup is every second Tuesday of the month. Uh, our next meetup will be October 10th and uh, as we're gearing up for the winter. And uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be a good time. Have some guests already lined up. Um, should be a really fun experience. Uh, for now, we'll go ahead and let you all go. Thank you to everybody who tuned in and uh was tuned in to us rather than the Apple presentation. Uh, and uh, yeah, we hope to see you next month. Thank you everybody and uh, see you next time. Cool, we're offline, thank you.